So the question, can we fix it? Let's get to the point. The answer, yes, we can, obviously. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be here, I hope. So let me get, let me get, let me get on with my talk. Thank you very much, uh, Anya and the, and the team at UCD for the invite. It's very uh, nice to, to be able to share some of my experiences. Um, firstly, a caveat, small one. There will be obviously people here from uh, uh, STEM backgrounds and from arts and humanities. My focus as a physiologist has always been in, in the STEM disciplines, but I hope much, if not all, of what I'm sharing with you today is going to cover both of those cultures. Um, the examples I use will instinctively, for me, be from the STEM, so, so bear with me on that. So the things I'm going to cover today, and I discussed these with Anya earlier, uh, are the drivers for change, active learning strategies and some tools, some, and the benefits for advanced, enhanced student outcomes, and of course the, the challenges we may face, and I'll do them in varying orders, okay, so it's not going to be a uh, a very straight uh, a lecture like that and I don't think there's many bullet points. So let me start with a quote, this is a quote, with the undi undeniable upsurge of scientific research we cannot continue to rely on the mere fact that we have learned how to teach what is known. We must learn to teach the best attitude to what is not yet known <laughs> and with that stated by for instance um, the SAGE committee looking into Covid or the Office for Students uh, in, the, in the UK. No, in fact, it was a quote from Charles uh, Scott Sherrington some hundred years ago. So a hundred years ago, the information was already exploding. And that was then, and this is now, this is the so-called uh, uh, knowledge doubling curve, which is an exponential curve, which uh, when this came out, uh, predicted by 2020, only two years ago, knowledge now some of that is just cats playing piano i totally accept that that, that knowledge is, is, a, is, a, is a big term uh, is doubling every 12 hours that rate of doubling is phenomenal and of course it implodes into our curriculum which then becomes overloaded and then it leads to the unintended consequence i think of an instrumental approach to learning that will be taken by our students you cannot blame them for being strategic and the answer is not to pack more PowerPoints into an hour and it's not to speak even quicker. The answer is to change the culture of learning. Let's just start off with a definition. We all agree, I hope, with the same definition of learning, that it is a, a difficult and complex process of conceptual change, not just uh, memorising and uh, uh, facts. And I think we, we all, if we all start with that, then we're, we're on our way together. But even though we as educators believe that that is the uh, purpose of learning, if you ask learners, mostly students, uh, what they think learning is, this is what they think in, in uh, increase, decreasing order. Their first thing, increasing knowledge, memorizing and reproducing right up there with what they think learning is, and then acquiring facts and skills that can be applied. Much, much lower minority of students, a very small number of students, put understanding as, uh, as what learning is, and interpreting reality in a new way, or anything related to that, is even lower than that. And of course, we understand uh, from our educational backgrounds that this is the difference between surface learning and deep learning. Okay, and we all would prefer our students to be able to move towards deep learning, of course. Another way of looking at these two differences is done by and done to. Much of what student learning seems to be uh, focused on or what they believe it should be is done to. Learning is done to them whether learning is done by them is, is much harder for them to understand. And this, of course, leads to potentially one of the best bits of uh, feedback I've ever had, and, and that's this. The problem with Kumar is, is that he expects us to do all the work. And of course, that is a very insightful uh, comment by a student, but I don't expect them to do all of the work, but I do expect them to do a fair bit of it. I think that's what we're gonna do. So let's do some work ourselves. Right, apologies for those of you who are physicists or uh, uh, engineers or, anybody with, with that background really. I'm going to take us back to school. Hopefully all of you can recall back to your school days, the very simple concept of atoms and molecules and so forth. Let's consider here on the left in pink. This is a simple model showing uh, how metallic bonds are formed. You've got the protons in the middle and the electrons circulating around them. These charges uh, in a metal make the atom space completely equally apart. So it's a uniform distribution as you can see there on the left. The uh, picture on the right there with the blue shows how those electrons are actually delocalized within the metal. This delocalization of electrons allows the conduction of electricity through the metal and of course the conduction of heat. 
So all I want you to be aware of at the moment is that the atoms are regularly spaced. Now, I mentioned heat. If we heat those atoms, if we heat those atoms, each of the atoms gains energy and vibrates more and moves further away from its neighbors. Okay, so you get thermal expansion, the metal expands, something we all know, I imagine. It's something instinctively you sort of know now, but you were taught it a long time ago. And I imagine all of your students would know this, whether they're from the Department of English or the Department of, of Engineering. So I would give this, and in fact, I have given this to the students. I then ask them, is there any problems with this? Do you want me to go over anything? And they don't, they've got this, they've got it, they're bored, they know this. So then I ask them a question. This is live in a classroom with clickers. And here's the question. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole. When the plate is uniformly heated, does the diameter of the hole increase, stay the same, or decrease? Now, I want you to have a think about that. Write your answer down on a bit of paper somewhere, uh, and, and let's see how we do in a moment, okay? So there's the, there's the question. So this is really simple. We all know what happens to the atoms when we heat them up. So here's the question. And this hopefully will allow us to get to the crux of what active learning benefits there are. Here's another question. The crew of Apollo 33 come back to Earth, some hypothetical future from a long distance into outer space, and they bring back an unknown contagious virus, a bit familiar, uh, that causes them severe illness. Here's the question. Which student learning outcomes would our students need to solve this problem? Have a think about that. And uh, there may not be a single answer for that one. And here's a, here's a quote from Greg Scutcher's. We're handing this generation of students the most enormous set of problems any generation has ever faced, but we're failing to deliver the kind of rigorous education that they need to solve them. We're giving them more and more facts, but will they be future-proofing their knowledge? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. So really, on all of you here, I, I appreciate uh, 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 focused on education um, and you know this hierarchy this is actually a uh, um, an adaptation from Bloom but it's one I prefer using it's hierarchy of educational learning objectives surface learning the simple memory recall and then moving through to deeper learning through the phases of understanding application analysis and then what I quite like is evaluating and creation moving from surface to deep learning i.e moving from familiarity of a subject to knowing and we believe in the three years or four years of a degree course that we take our students through this but do we really or again in pedagogic terms we're moving from an understanding of knowledge as fixed and therefore receivable the done to that i talked about earlier uh, towards knowledge as contested and therefore requiring construction the done by this is what uh, uh, we want our students to be able to leave our universities with and so they, they, they gain uh, confidence in knowledge, they see the relevance of the knowledge, and then they can make judgments of the knowledge. And that, again, is, is, is really what a university education should be. So active learning supports that deep learning that we want to do, and it supports the constructed uh, knowledge that we're after. And that's what I'm a, I'm a big believer in this. It places a greater degree of responsibility on the learner than any passive uh, approach. And that's what makes it... Uh, uh, so valuable in terms of uh, knowledge acquisition but it does require um, uh, instructor guidance okay so this is not anything to do with removing the role of the instructor at all if anything the instructor becomes more crucial in active learning than in passive learning and this is something that I've had to discuss with many of my colleagues who think their jobs are at risk with uh, technology Oops, why is my slides not moving sorry Right, so let's go back to our question. Here's our question, circular hole, when it's uniformly heated, does it uh, increase, stay the same or decrease? I don't know what I, I'm not asking you to do. Any, I've not brought any polling software. You can, you can do it over the internet. I haven't done it. What I'd like you to do in the uh, reactions, if we can look at the reactions uh, on, on, our, on our slides somewhere down there, I think Susan or somebody can look at it for me. If you think it increases, put a thumbs up. If you think it stays the same, give me a, uh, a high five or if you think it's going to decrease let's go for a, a round of applause so if you could just take your answer and, and and do that now it'd be great i can't actually see the reactions i realize now i'm looking at this or maybe i can uh, it doesn't matter i don't need to um oops let me go back let me go back let me go back um i don't need to see them 
Um, hopefully you can put your reactions on. I don't know why my slides are not, uh, I'm not being able to go backwards or forwards easily. I'll go backwards on here, can I? Yeah. So hopefully you've all had a go. I can't see the reactions. I'm guessing if, 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 if uh, I could see them. Oh, but there we go. Three participants raised hands. Have we got any, any others? Doesn't really tell me if you can do it. So some of you, four raised hands now. So some of you raising your hands uh, and some of you I'm imagining will be increasing and some of you will be decreasing. I'm not going to, to race along with this, but let's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll press too much time on this, but what's just happened? What's just happened is that you've had to make a commitment to an answer. It wasn't that you just think, oh, I know that, I know about it. You've made a commitment, but more importantly than that, you've had to externalize it. Now that may be through showing a hand. You, I may have asked you in a classroom to tell a student next to you and have a conversation, or you may have just used the clicker and put your answer up anonymously. That's fine. But you had to move uh, from your answer from what you thought to reasoning to thinking about it but ultimately you were actively involved in the learning so i would have given my medical students that that question when they first started with me in the very first flip session i do with them because i try to explain to them what the purpose of flip teaching is this is the answers they gave me now i don't know how you went there because i didn't use the polling uh, uh software but um my students uh show 60 percent said the hole would get smaller uh, 28% said it said the same and 12% and said it increased. So I would take the answers from them and then I would give them the answer, of course. So let's break this down into thinking about what it means. Let's just look, no, forget the whole sheet of metal with a hole. Let's just look at what we're interested in, which is the hole. Let's just look at the atoms at the rim of the hole. I've just drawn a number of atoms here. Obviously there's a lot more. Each of those atoms is gonna gain energy when I heat it and they've got to move apart. The only way, the only way they can move apart is to get further away from each other in this way. So the hole has to get bigger. There is the only answer is the hole gets bigger when you heat this piece of metal. Okay, now many of you may have got it. I know I tried it with my colleagues and many don't get it. But every time your parents, a colleague or somebody has said, I can't get the lid off this jar of pickles, what do you do? You heat it. We use this knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that when we heat the hole, it must get bigger. The jar of pickles does not get tighter. So applying knowledge using ways through active learning will allow our students to consolidate that knowledge. And what you can see here is that I had 88% of A-star students got it wrong, even though all of them told me that they didn't need any more explanation when I was telling them about the, uh, the atom spacing. This is what's called a common sense misunderstanding. And there's a lot of it about and teaching medical students it's obviously critical that they don't make too many of these in their career. What about our alien disease? Which student outcomes would be required to solve it? Well, I don't think there's a single outcome per se in terms of, of, of information, but there is uh, student attributes, problem identification, critical thinking skills, evaluating evidence, looking at alternative ideas, and having, very importantly, a tolerance for ambiguity. Many of my students don't have a tolerance for ambiguity. They want the answer, because a book said this, you said this, but somebody's got it wrong. Okay, so where are we teaching this? How are we teaching this? How are we future-proofing? Only constructive knowledge will save us. So at the moment, I think I have to use a quote like this, our present undergraduate programmes are often dominated with coping with the present or at worst the past we haven't really future proofed them as much as we would perhaps have hoped oops i still keep getting every time i change it okay now this is important i mentioned to Anya at the start here about assessment you, you you're probably going to need a workshop on assessment soon if you if active learning takes off our imagination should not be constrained by current models of measurement there's no point doing active learning and then going back to the uh, uh, guess one from three kind of uh, scenario okay so the future is now we're here are we ready to embrace it because certainly our students are our students have embraced the future for years this is gen z and beyond they are more global they're demanding they're eager to stand out they want experiences they're very pro-social responsibility you all know that by teaching they're the first generation growing up virtually born with mobile phones uh, the internet of course and social media and they just know that they can access information. Why are we giving it to them to just memorize macros? They can get it. We want to help them understand what to do with it. They have expertise in research. How many of my colleagues and your colleagues have said, wow, the 
projects the students done are amazing because they seem surprised that the students can do stuff when you take them off the leash and let them go. Of course they can. So can we fix it for our students to develop constructive knowledge as well as help them gain all these other attributes that we believe that is our responsibility uh, to make them ready for uh, postgraduate life in work? Of course, yes, we can, definitely. But we're not going to do it like this. We really are not going to do it like this. Why have we maintained a method of teaching that is goes back to uh, uh, you know, Greek times and so forth? And we've got the same lectures. There. I recognise these lectures. People asleep, people talking, nobody listening. The thing that's changed is that everybody's now got the book. In the old days, there was one person who had the book and everyone copied and transcribed the book. We've all got the book now. Some of us have got better books than others. It, it's, it's about sharing. We're certainly not going to get to change the world in this way as well, where students don't uh, uh, turn up. We just carry on giving the lecture. But how long has this been going on? I found this paper, uh, Medical Student Concentration During Lectures. It, it came from a, a people, I, I, I knew one of them uh, when I first joined Birmingham years ago, uh, but it came from the University of Birmingham. And this is just a graph showing uh, the time in a lecture against student attention. So they just asked the students to measure their attention during the lecture and you can see that this is where this 15 minute attention span I'm guessing if we did it now that curve is left shifted even more um, and said so the student concentration decline in the second half of the lecture I think many of us would be quite happy to get to the second half on a, in a passive lecture nowadays and so they said further studies of lecturing technique are required to determine how best to arrest the trend the other thing they said is why not just give half an hour use the active time and gain much more useful curriculum time for other teaching methods when was this paper written in the Lancet 1978 44 years ago so the evidence is there we all know it we know about attention spans at the heart of this comes what i think is called the teacher learner conundrum with us the teachers trying to get the most learning out of students as possible in this hour let's get it across and because of their um instrumental approach and the strategies they have to use this leads to a lot of issues that we are all aware of whether it's resistance to the sessions alienation cheating which we see is increasing covid has has really uh, brought that to the fore in some ways, corner cutting. But the fixation on credentials becomes critical for our students. Uh, Susan Blum has stated this is an industrialized model of a predetermined teacher-centric curriculum measured by time in seat and high stakes testing. That is what most universities are still doing. And if you do that, success, not learning, becomes the goal. And we need to think, is that what we're after? And who defines what that success is? Is it us? Is it the employer? Is it the student? You know, are we the hired help or are we the parents? I'd like to think we're the parents. Why do we do it then? Because it's safe. It's safe for many of our colleagues. It's safe for our students. That's why we persist with a, a method that works. You've got to a class university like UCD or Birmingham through a method of learning that works for you. Why would you want to change it? But here's another bit of evidence to help us think about changing it. At the bottom here on the x-axis, voluntary class attendance. This was a, a, a set of lectures that you could or you could choose to attend or not choose to attend against a final exam score. And you can see very clearly that a large number of students attended nothing but were top of the class. And another group of students attended almost everything and did far worse than most others. And clearly, we all know attendance has never been a proxy for learning. So we need to change. Students have to change their expectations of what uh, university education is, and we need to change how we teach. So the question is, are we ready? Are they ready? Are we able? Are we willing? I'm so glad to see you've got a workshop on this today that shows you are. So I flipped a long time ago, 12 years ago, probably, I, I decided I had enough of teaching the way I was taught to teach, the way I had been taught. And what made me teach change really was these six words here. Do I need to know this? I just got fed up with students after a, a, what I thought was a brilliant hour of, of, of educational exchange being asked, do I need to know this? So I flipped and, and flipped means moving the traditional model where knowledge acquisition happens in the classroom and knowledge construction happens on their own in, the, in, in their, in their uh, um, homes or whatever, uh, their, their, their halls of residence to the flipped, where knowledge acquisition occurs prior to the knowledge construction. So the student ac acquires knowledge on their own, in their own time, many times as they want, do it themselves quietly and comfortably and safely. And then we share in the classroom the knowledge construction. And I think that's what works really, really well for me and, and for my colleagues flipped. This is another way to look at it, moving from teacher-directed learning 
to student-centered learning where it's a collaboration between us and them and that means letting go of that safety net of being in charge the sage on the stage you are now just another member of this learning community and it can be tricky now i've got a lot of tips and and things like this i don't really want to spend too long on that because i'm aware of the time but um it takes time prepare fully you know and keep evolving it uh, it makes uh, uh, it better every year if you do that but you have to explain the students uh, to the students why flipped teaching is being done what the benefits are they are the stakeholder that you have to convince the most they don't believe you initially they need to keep being reinforced not just at the start but during and even at the end you will get resistance from some students and you will get resistance from some staff you have to ensure whatever software you come up with that they can get access to it easily and uh, you give them enough time to do the work prior to this i do a week by week um, curriculum really with the students and it works really well you need to give prompt and adaptive feedback on all work adaptive feedback there's no point going with a preconceived answer to something if they all go right then you can just acknowledge that and and, and maybe deal with the one or two students who didn't get it right explain to them why if they all got it wrong go differently so you've always got to be adaptive you know respect your audience and if you do that you will enable an effective student experience you'll give them active engagement with challenges you can involve other staff you can get different perspectives you get reflection you know as our as our community of, of learners becomes more diverse this is even more exciting really you get even more of the uh, diverse responses the uh, reflective responses and and challenging people it's, it's 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 very exciting if you get it right so what have i done i've got rid of my traditional lecture and what i do is instead i take that traditional lecture and i break it down into maybe five or six five minute six seven minute panopto recording so these are given to the students but it's not a one hour trawl they don't switch on and then let it run they get maybe seven of these let's say and uh oh, sorry six of these and they're all given a, a title how we breathe uh, gas exchange whatever it is so they can go back to it. it's like a youtube clip they'll look at it if they've got that attention span they'll they'll look at it and then they can look at another one but they don't have to do all at once they do that and they have to do that before they come to me at the end of each one of those clips i give them a thought question and that thought question really is for them it's open it's often an open question but it gives them a, a chance to see what i think is the most important part of that five or six minutes so the question focuses on the key outcome for that bit so effectively each of these is a learning outcome for the student I then go to my flip session, which can take 50 minutes, the same amount of time as the traditional lecture. I don't use PowerPoint in there. I use only a visualizer. And by drawing, it slows me down. It allows them to see, and it's very, very much more engaging. So if you've got some money spared, buy visualizers and get them in. I use props, demos, models. I get my colleagues to help me or whatever. And I have firstly to answer all of the questions at the end of each of the podcasts. I also give them new problems with clickers or peer peer teaching or so forth. Okay. So the response where I use turning point has been superb for that. And peer instruction is superb, especially if you get a range of answers, you get them to talk to somebody within their vicinity that had a different answer and then see what happens. So does it work? Well, this graph uh, shows that here's my nine. This is this is a respiratory course. There's nine podcasts. Each of them has five or six of these things in. This is how many times or how long a student stuck with them. This is one. This means they they watch the whole thing. This is where they watch less than the whole thing. This is where they watch most of it. And this blue line here is how many times they watched it. So you can see they all watched it more than once, and they all watched it for about the right time. Sometimes they speed up. That's why the the time goes down. My speech allows them to uh, double the speed on the podcast but they this this doesn't mean they weren't engaging they were engaging and the results were as expected they did better in the exams even though the exams were pretty much what they always had been i wasn't allowed to change my assessment it had to stick with the uh, the program's needs uh, the, the results of anything got slightly better but they really did very very well and 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 some students uh, did particularly well on it and this is uh, evidence that um, peer instruction works. So this is two questions. Neither of these questions would have been uh, told to the students in the uh, pre-learning or in my uh, flip session at all. These are based around application of knowledge they have. They've never heard of 
Cartanega syndrome, for instance, on the right, or they've never done this maths question on the left. You can see the right answer is green, the wrong answers are red, and this is how the students replied on the poll. When I re-polled after some peer instruction, you can see that the shift is much more to the green. There's still some red, obviously, we, we don't get everybody to shift their answers, but you can see this is peer instruction. I haven't said a word. I put the question up, I polled it, and then I've asked them to talk to each other and re-poll, and they've always got it in the right, almost always in the right direction. In my pre-flip uh, teaching, before I flip with them, I tell them why I'm going to do it. I go through a lot of explanations with them, explain evidence and so forth. And then I ask them, do you think this approach that I'm going to give you, which is not being done by anybody else, because I teach them in the second semester of year one, no one did it in first semester, do you think it's going to help? And here's a Likert scale. And um, this is the answers I get. Strongly agree, agree, and somewhat agree are far greater. So I've explained to them why. I ask them a simple question. I uh, like, what do you think, what, think of something you're good at. How did you become good at it? And invariably they became good at it through a load of different ways, having a go, learning, watching, practicing, doing it again, YouTube, not by just going to a lecture, that's for sure. So they understand what the principle is. With turning technology, you can use, you know, word clouds. So I said, look, if you strongly agreed that this is gonna help you, or if you strongly disagreed or disagreed, stick it in a word cloud. So they just wrote a sentence and I put a word cloud up. So this is why students think it'll help. Learning, they've written, understanding's big. The, the, the size of the word is, is the proportional number of responses. Active, understanding, help, better, engaging. All those words are key to why active learning works and the students get it. But what about the students who didn't get it? Now you can see there's fewer words here because there were obviously many fewer students who thought it wouldn't work. Time, preparation, much, too much. Yeah, difficulty, homework, anatomy for medical students is, is something that they worry about a lot. Very rudely, someone's written bold, which I, 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 I guess at least they're awake. So you can see that students understand what's going on, but you've got to keep reminding them. At the end of the course, I ask them again the same question. Do you feel that this helped you understand the topic? And you can see the vast majority do think that it's helped them. But you're always going to get some people who struggle with it. And this is still year one. You've got to keep at it. It isn't going to be an overnight a success, a panacea in, in, one, in one swoop, you have to stick at it. So active learning works and active learning includes flip teaching, of course, it's more effective, it's better retention of information, better performance in assessments. So should we ask or should we tell? Well, obviously we should ask. How's the best way to convince students that it works well? Convince them through assessment. And this is uh, um, the results of a large meta-analysis of something like 200, well, 225 studies looking at uh, uh, active learning versus traditional passive learning and you can see I'm not going to go through the maths but what we're seeing here on this graph this is the number of students who fail in blue is the active teaching and in yellow is the uh, traditional teaching and you can see the left shift here in blue tells you that far fewer students fail if you give them active learning and this is uh, the paper uh, eight years ago, this paper came out, and Eric Mazur, who's at Harvard, a physicist, is one of the sort of leading exponents of active learning. He actually says it's almost unethical to be lecturing if you've got this evidence, and yet we're still doing it. So active learning can take place with all different group sizes. I do it with large groups, almost 400 medical students in a lecture theatre, but you can do it at a small group size, obviously in a tutorial or at the individual level as well. And there are a lot of different ways you can do it with uh, groups in multiple class sessions and, and small groups, large groups and so forth. And in your workshops, you probably go over some of these, these things. But when I reflected on this, I thought, you know, this reminds me a bit of, of back at Oxford, as it were. What you have is pre-learning, went to a lecture, didn't really get it. But in the uh, tutorial, which is the basis of Oxbridge, if you like, there's one uh, professor, a member of staff, Don, and maybe two students. There's nowhere to hide. But that's where you do the active learning. You just talk. What did you think? What did I think? How can you question it? You get individualized, immediate feedback. That's how it works. We can't do that. We don't all have that uh, resource and, and, and time and tradition. But what we can do with active learning is do this in the large lecture theatre. And I have done this with large lecture. <clears throat> We're effectively giving students, individual students in a large cohort, individualized and immediate feedback on their learning and understanding. Did they understand whether that hole would get bigger or not? What was the reasoning? What did they understand? What did they not understand? And you can do that on a one-to-one -one basis 
with them in a lecture theatre through the technologies we have. So given that, why aren't we all doing it? Well, not lots of reasons. I found this paper, there's quite a good paper on your, uh, if, if, you, if you look into it, I mentioned to you before. This is actually on interdisciplinarity, why it's so hard. And there was a question this morning for, for John about interdisciplinarity, why it's so difficult. Um, and, and, and what this group have done is they've looked at the barriers and the barriers are regulations. You can't do it, my, my governing body won't let you do it. Uh, uh, the GMC won't let you do it. The learning outcomes don't do it. Um, we haven't got enough staff. So there's all the barriers are there and we can see that. But another big barrier is student resistance. And a lot of staff don't like when students resist anything. And this is an interesting paper I found uh, where they looked at what they call feeling of learning against actual learning. And what they did with students is they gave them, uh, they split the group into two. Uh, it was either uh, statics in physics or fluids. And half the group got taught in the traditional way and half the group got taught in the active way. And then they flipped for the fluids or the statics and, and the, each group did the other way. So this is one of the best paired uh, studies ever done, I think, on, on, on active learning because they've, each student has had uh, a go at passive and had a go at active. And what they did is they asked the students, what did you think about it? And you can see that the, the light gray here says that uh, in the passive teaching, they got all the positives. I enjoyed it. I wish everyone did it this way. So the passive was seen, the feeling of learning by the students was enormous. And yet when the exams were done, the results were the other way around. Students who had the active learning did better. So your feeling of learning is not the same as your actual learning. And that's uh, very important. And, and one outcome of this is that attempts to evaluate instruction based on students' perceptions of learning will inadvertently promote the inferior or passive pedagogic methods. Staff will see that students feel we evaluate them before uh, the exam. John mentioned this morning, we should perhaps evaluate them three years after they graduate. Other issues, as the size of the group increases, we're not no lo longer in the Oxford tutorial room of uh, three people where there's only three possible person-person interactions, yeah? I teach 364 students in the group. There are actually 66,066 potential face-to-face -face interactions. Obviously we can't do it, we're limited. Uh, by size but that makes it look difficult doesn't it it's always going to be difficult and if you get into that difficult position you you end up becoming more the leader the sage on the stage you end up developing bureaucratic processes you have to do this you must do this by then and then as we get more diversity in our groups it gets difficult to communicate the cooperation consensus so all of this means it's just too tiring to do and at the end of a working day, we just can't face doing any more. And that's why we find it hard, I think. But we can miss opportunity because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. A quote from Thomas Edison. Let's not miss this opportunity because it enriches your life. I felt alive teaching the, the way I do more than I ever did passively. And our students are enriched as well. So moving on. We can facilitate this. If you look at this paper, you can facilitate it. You have to change the culture. You have to give recognition for people who are doing it well. You have to look at the structures, the environment. Do we have to change the way our lecture theatres are? And eventually you look at solutions. You communicate this. You use the right narratives with people. You keep going back. You look at the structure of our teaching, which is what you're doing today, and ultimately culture change. You use role models and so forth to make it happen. And it can be done. So what do you need to support active learning? I think you need three things really. You need to believe the methodology. You need mastery of your subject. That shouldn't be an issue for academics, but for some of my colleagues, they're a bit anxious that the student's gonna ask them a stupid question. There are no stupid questions. There are only more difficult ones. And you need a degree of self-confidence, but you know, these things can all be taught. What do you need for effective? You need an instructional goal. You need to know what it is you're trying to do. You know, what is it? Is it a fact you're trying to learn or is it a concept? We need to know what information we want to acquire, what it tells us about students' needs. We need to think carefully about this again. Let's look at our outcomes. We need the techniques to help us respond in real time to what our students. This is the clickers, real time teaching, but you can use hands. You can do whatever you need to do. Rethink how we structure a lecture and the teaching around the lecture, the learning around the lecture. We need to be flexible. We don't need the hour. Why do we need the hour? We could have sometimes two hours maybe, or maybe 30 minutes. Let's look at that more flexibly because we're being led now by the technologies that run our curriculum. We have to forego some content for understanding and we have to understand who's in the room, respect all members in the, in, in the room and, and listen to all their perspectives. And I mentioned we need to look at assessment. That's perhaps for another day. But one of the things Anya, you know, rightly pointed out in, in, in a discussion I had with her pre-learning is that, you know, letting go content for understanding seems to be difficult for some people. But 
the amount of content we have it's got to go it's got to go we can't teach everything all the time we teach students how to find that content should they need it but they can do that so let me leave now with, with the last little bit here this is a paper that was written by a student steph lomas uh, from the student union the guild of students at uh, uclan uh, uh, in england and she looked at uh, how students measure success at their time in, at university and she said there were five success measures for students emotional resilience careers professionalism academic knowledge and accomplishment being able to give back and confidence okay those are the five key things that students use to measure success where do you think academic knowledge and accomplishment came in the rank one two three four or five now again i'm learning how to use uh, active learning even though we're just on zoom you've got a chat feature here this could take take it apart susan or or Jillian, whoever's in charge of looking at the chat just on the chat feature stick in a number one to five one if you think academic knowledge was seen by students as the most important success measure for their time at university put a five if you think they thought it was the least important okay so the most important one the least important five stick a rank down just do that so if obviously if it was a teaching session i'd give students enough time to do this properly we could get them to talk about it with each other and so on we can repoll it's 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 very exciting it's not just about you so i'm not going to spend too long on that but i'm not even going to look at the chat but okay i can't i, I because I'm, I'm worried i won't be able to get back to my slide but i'll give you the answer okay you put your scores in i can see the the chat numbers have gone up we'll lose some of the questions people wrote earlier i think the answer is fourth fourth first was confidence second was emotional resilience what they seem to think makes them successful are in fact what our employers would probably want out of them as well so let's not worry about losing some content for understanding we need to teach the students we have not the students we wish we had they're not all going to become us you know john talked this morning about a large number of his engineering students don't even want to be engineers at the end of it can you imagine the world's changing so let me leave you with this final quote what is urgently needed is an educational program in which students become interested in actively knowing rather than passively believing and you know what it just might not be that scary if we give it a go okay that's me done i'm going to stop sharing there and give you back the screen there you go thank you